Two and a Half Admins, episode 189. I'm Joe. I'm Jim. And I'm Alan. And here we are again. Users ditch Glassdoor. Stunned by site adding real names without consent. So on the off chance any of you out there don't know what Glassdoor.com is, it is a notorious site where people who have been employed, typically at larger companies that lots of people have heard of, they go to the site and they give anonymous accounts of what their time working for that company was like. Pro tip, go and have a look at the canonical one. It's uh, quite something. (laughs) So yeah, if you're thinking about working for a large corporation, you can go look at, you know, reviews on Glassdoor and see if the people who have already worked there largely think it was a good experience or a terrible one. Now, to be clear here, when we say the site started using users' real names without their consent, we're not actually saying that it just pasted them directly on the public reviews where anybody can see them. That's not what's going on. What we're talking about is privately de-anonymizing data, which in one sense doesn't sound like it's as bad because, well, it's just Glassdoor that knows the horrible things you said about the last company you worked for, right? Not anybody else. Well, maybe, maybe not because you don't know for certain that Glassdoor will never sell that information and you certainly don't know that Glassdoor will never be breached. We actually had a fair amount of off-air discussion about this before deciding the angle on how to cover it, and uh, Alan and I were both pointing out to Joe, name one major site that all of our listeners will be familiar with which hasn't been breached in the last 10 years. And spoiler alert, nobody can really think of one. Let's talk about the timing and acquisitions that led to this. Glassdoor acquired Fishbowl. It's a networking site for professionals. So the whole goal of a site like Fishbowl is to make sure everybody knows who everybody else is and promote them. Whereas the goal of Glassdoor was to leave safely anonymized reviews where you could recount your experiences at a company without worrying about that being, you know, held against you at future employers or, you know, potentially even being sued by your last employer. And when you de-anonymize that data, you strip those protections and those safeguards. I'm not sure that most people are worried about their next door neighbor knowing it was them that said their last company sucked. Their neighbor already knows. Probably most of the people who know them personally already know how they felt about their last job. What they're going to be worried about, I would think, would be the companies that are doing business with Fishbowl and with Glassdoor pay a little extra to, you know, find out like, well... You got anything on this guy before we hire him? Has he left any reviews anywhere? And uh, that's not what the site was supposed to be for. Yeah, well, and just the fact that Glassdoor was about anonymously leaving information about companies used to work at and salary ranges and so on really seems to be at cross purposes with Fishbowl, which is a professional networking app that wants to require all users to verify their identity. And then they decided to connect the backends of these together and make every Glassdoor user automatically a Fishbowl user. We should also be clear here that um, Glassdoor is not only asking users to provide their personal identifiable information and saying, but pinky swear we won't tell anybody else unless we do. In some cases where users have declined to provide that information, Glassdoor has decided to make their own best guess as to who that person is using what metadata they do have and trying to match it to various recon data they can find on the web and then tie that person's personal identifiable information to the anonymized originally reviews. And will they always get that right? Maybe, but probably not. So now you not only have a site that said, hey, come leave your anonymous review, and then said, well, you left your anonymous review, but now tell us exactly who you are. Don't worry, you'll still be anonymous. But also a site that says, oh, you won't tell us? We'll, we'll just take our best guess and we'll slap it in there anyway. Yeah. And they had another, uh, for example, Josh Simon from the Matrix.org Foundation discovered that Glassdoor had not only messed up and said he worked at a different employer, but claimed that he lived in London when he actually is based in California. He said, it was bizarre because I had never provided that information and it was somewhat incoherent mix of random details. And so requested his account be deleted rather than remain on a site that might randomly update his profile without notifying him of potentially inaccurate changes. I know that Matrix do have an office in London, so that would be where that came from. But that doesn't make it any better, does it? Most likely where it came from is the same place that it came from when, you know, that one kooky friend or relative you have that fancies themselves great at cyber stalking just goes to like a million white pages and people finder and Spokio sites and gets together everything they can find on a particular name of somebody and just assumes it's all about the person that they think it is and true. 
Well, no, it's whatever crap you could find on the internet. It's interesting that in the Ars piece, they refer to a lady called Monica, who I don't think that's her real name, but she had a real battle with Glassdoor to delete her data. It was a lot harder than it ought to have been. And even then, I think they said, well, we'll delete it in 30 days after they finally acquiesced. So what you're telling me is the company that took anonymized data, demanded it be de-anonymized, and then did their own half-baked internet research to de-anonymize it when the actual user refused to, you're saying that that company acted weird and proprietary about personal data and didn't want to let users have control of it? Telegram's peer-to-peer -peer login system is a risky way to save $5 a month. This one is, is weird. So basically, in order to send the two-factor authentication messages, when somebody tries to log in, they're asking other people to consent to having their phone send the 2FA token instead. Via SMS. Yeah, it's unclear at this point if this is Telegram trying to save money by not having to pay the carriers to send the text messages, or if it's, as they claim in the article about the message is not getting delivered to certain people, whereas a direct text message from a person rather than from a short code might get better delivery rates, which seems a bit weird. I imagine most phone carriers are going to try harder to deliver 2FA tokens than they are to deliver random messages from people. Yeah, but it's fine. You get free Telegram premium. You get loads of extra reaction emojis. You get the voice message AI voice to text business. Well, only if they use your phone to send at least 150 text messages. And also, they're like, yes, yeah, sorry, this is going to show all the people that we send messages to your phone number. And we have no way of stopping them from texting you other than we ask them not to. Or calling you. No, they tell them not to. They say, don't do this. But they're absolutely going to do that. I mean, I assume both of you has at some point been on the wrong end of a Joe job where your phone number got used as the spoofed number that somebody was sending spam texts from. I got ones where they did actual calls. I got a bunch of voicemails in Spanish yelling at me for telemarketing them or something. Yep. I've been on the wrong end of Joe jobs from uh, text message campaigns and also robocall campaigns. And, you know, I you get people calling you like just incandescently angry because they think you're a spammer and there's finally a spammer that they can yell at. And... <laughs> Maybe one time out of five, you get somebody relatively reasonable and you can explain to them what a Joe job is and, you know, what spoofed numbers are. And yes, I understand that you called the number that you saw in the from on the text message that you got, but that wasn't me. In my experience, about one person out of five will listen to that and like realize that you're speaking to them and not at them and you sound like a reasonable human being. That's how they should interact with you. The other four out of five, nah, man, they figure they've got their teeth in the neck of a spammer and they ain't letting go. That's what you're opening yourself up to. I think the worst part of this is that if you opt into it and Telegram doesn't send enough text messages with your phone number, you don't get the gift code. Yeah. And a cynical person would say that they might send 149 and then move on to the next person. Well, it says 150 is the maximum. They don't specify the minimum to get the gift code. But yeah, basically <laughs> one less than the minimum off each phone to not have to give out the $5. I, I think we got to be honest here. I mean, I, I don't doubt that in some cases, Telegram may be able to more reliably deliver a short code via a relayed SMS from a nearby private person's telephone mm -hmm. than, you know, via a service. You know, they may be operating in countries where it's hard to get set up with those services or those services aren't reliable or whatever. I I'm willing to accept those are reasons that you can look at and say, yes, I can understand why you would say that. But I also don't think any reasonable person would look at this and say, I don't think this is a cash grab. Let's be honest, this is a cash grab. It's a way to save some money. Well, and I think it's also a way to get people to try premium and then miss it and actually end up subscribing. I think you just came up with an alternate spelling of cash grab, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> well, as someone who was gifted Telegram premium for a year and then that friend wouldn't gift it to him again and whose wife said, no, you're not buying Telegram premium, that's ridiculous. I mean, I'm not going to say I'm going to do it, but when I heard about it, I thought, hmm, for a second before going, nah, it's not worth it. Because it was pretty cool to have Telegram Premium. 
Honestly, I would say to me, this is more an example of why I am so against having a mobile app for everything, because it just, it broadens the scope of what the damn thing might be doing behind your back. The fact that Telegram can, technically speaking, do this should be a little bit of a wake-up call, in my opinion, to, you know, the folks who who are normally completely okay. Oh, I've got an app for this website, an app for that website, an app for the other website. Well, you're starting to see why. Because having an app means that whoever runs that app can do an awful lot more. And in some cases, you know, it can be a little disturbing, the breadth of things that can be done via smartphone app. Like make calls and send text messages on your behalf without you knowing about it when it happens. Yeah, you know, my first thought there was, why are they not doing app-based authentication? But I guess in the case of Telegram, it's because they're trying to verify your phone number, not actually a login 2FA. Because why don't they just do the 2FA in the app that they obviously already have on your phone? Like you said, because then they wouldn't be sure that that really was your phone number. And you know, every other alternate technical method you can think of to verify possession of a particular phone number costs money. This one doesn't. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Tailscale. Go to tailscale.com slash 25A. Tailscale is an easy-to-deploy, zero-config, no-fuss VPN that allows you to build simple networks across complex infrastructure. It's super simple to set up, and you can have machines and devices all over the world connected to each other as if they were on the same LAN in minutes. It's WireGuard on easy mode. Jim tried Tailscale and found it incredibly easy to pick up and use for the first time. He liked that most of the time it immediately negotiates a direct point-to-point connection that's almost as fast as encrypted point-to-point, and it's got fallback modes to keep you functioning even if something changes the network topology and breaks the point-to-point introduction. So support the show and check out Tailscale for yourself. Go to tailscale.com 25a and try Tailscale out for free for up to 100 devices and 3 users with no credit card required. That's tailscale.com 25a. A. Feds ordered Google to unmask certain YouTube users. Yeah, this one's a, a kind of weird one. So it turns out that undercover police sent certain people a link to a video to try to, to capture them, come and watch it, and then went to Google and said, we want the IP address and name and everything you know about all the people that watch this video between January 1st and January 8th. Of course, the police doing this kind of sting operation thing, weren't smart enough to make the video unlisted. So because it showed up in the algorithm, it was watched over 30,000 times. So it's not just the people they sent the link to that they were trying to target to unmask. It's just 30,000 people. Alan, you're being both too unkind and too kind in assuming that the police just didn't think of making it unlisted because the first thing I thought is they probably knew exactly what they were doing and did not send that video to their targets until it had a believable amount of traffic on it to make it look like a legit video. Yeah, although even then you would switch it to unlisted or something so that the algorithm would stop sending new people to it to contaminate your list of people who watch this video on the first week of the year. But then your target might notice that it was unlisted. You can figure that out. Yes, but if they've already gone to the video, it's too late for them. (laughs) Yeah, but you don't want them to know, do you? Surely they could just get a video that's less popular, that's related to what you were talking about, and, oh, this video that I linked to, and it's not something that's going to be hugely popular. It might not be a very good video, for example. It sounds to me like you're, uh, you're advocating for a considerably greater standard of professionalism and care than we normally expect from law enforcement. Yeah, and I don't know if Google's more or less willing to provide this information in bulk. I know with even Google Analytics and so on, if the traffic isn't enough where you might be able to identify individual people, they won't give you the data. But in this case, the the police are like, we want the names and all the information you have and the IP addresses of these people, which I think is uh, kind of over the top. Yeah, and we're burying the lead a little bit because we're talking a lot about the mechanics and not much about the the legalities and the... uh, the political implications and personal implications of this. Well, I guess maybe even starting with why they're going after these particular people, and it's literally because they were selling Bitcoins for cash? No, let's not start with that, because honestly, that's a little bit irrelevant. The real issue here is that, you know, what the cops are trying to do 
is they're trying to make it a potential crime for you to watch whatever the YouTube algorithm threw at you. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to think that just because the YouTube algorithm threw this particular video at me in my playlist while I was sitting on my couch in my underwear at 11 o'clock last night and I let it play it, that now cops are going to come knock on my door and ask me, why were you watching this video last night, citizen? That's not cool. That's not the way things are supposed to work. Yeah, and I guess that's why I we immediately went down there like why did they use a video that was still getting new traffic and so on to try to do their dragnet on top of the fact that their dragnet is probably wrong to begin with because the things that the cops care about and the things that alan jude and jim salter care about are very different subsets there's not a lot of overlap in that venn diagram i'm not gonna say there's none there absolutely is some but not as much as i would like there to be yeah and the cops arguing quote there is reason to believe that these records would be relevant and material to an ongoing criminal investigation, including by providing identification information about the perpetrators, which is the vaguest thing ever. What it actually kind of reminds me of is uh, some of the anti-drug legislation we have in, in my country, in the United States. We get these ridiculous court cases where the cops will, instead of suing a person who they pulled over who had $10,000 in cash in the glove box, they actually sue the $10,000 <laughs> in order to attain it for the police department. What? And in a lot of ways, this reminds me of that because it, it's yet another way that cops attempt to avoid having a defendant on the other side of something iffy that they're doing. I'd heard of companies being a person, but money, <laughs> that's a bit of a stretch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, money can be objects, locations, you name it. And this, this is how they go after alleged property of drug dealers and whatever. The idea is that, oh, it's a tool for them to get the money off the street so they can't just keep selling those drugs. But, you know, if you follow the news stories on this, it keeps on ending up, you know, nailing people who are clearly like migrant families, you know, just like working class folks that are, you know, moving from one town to another. And, you know, it, it's it's one of these deals where like, OK, yeah, sure. Drug dealers who carry around large amounts of cash are absolutely a thing. So are working class people who are just trying to get from A to B. And like, yeah, I get the idea that you might argue, oh, but what if a drug dealer just pretends that they are a family, you know, with a station wagon loaded up with luggage and the family dog or whatever? That shouldn't be a defense, which just brings us right back again, ultimately, to what this has all really been about, which is the cops have very different priorities and are looking at the world through a very different lens. Their thought is, do not let bad guy get away. That's the most charitable interpretation I can possibly have, is that job number one is catch bad guy. Whereas we tend to be a little bit more concerned with a, maybe don't wreck my life while you're catching the bad guys. Yeah, they have a, a couple other examples here where apparently a bomb threat was called in to a trash can that happened to have be in the sight line of some business's webcam that had a live stream. And so they suspect the perpetrator who called in the fake bomb scare was watching the live stream. So they wanted to subpoena the records for the live stream, which is on a channel that has 130,000 subscribers. So let's unmask all of those people to maybe try to find one guy. It's like, does that make sense? What court is accepting that as a probable cause. You say 130,000 subscribers, that doesn't mean that that many people watch the live stream. No, but they're still unmasking a very large number of people to try to find one person. And that seems unreasonable. Yes. The fact that 130,000 people were subscribed is what tells you that is a pretty mainstream thing to be doing. And what you don't want to do is to be targeted as a criminal because you were doing something mainstream and normal which is exactly what we're talking about when we have these wide dragnets get cast. Interestingly, just earlier this month, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that an internet protocol address attracts a reasonable expectation of privacy protected under Section 8 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This decision has a practical implication for law enforcement authorities who will now need prior judicial authorization before requesting IP addresses from private organizations or internet service providers and search engines. Yeah, that'd be good if we all had that, eh? Mm -hmm. That'd be nice. Admittedly, we only got it like a couple of weeks ago and only by a five to four decision of the Supreme Court. Oh, wow. Well, let me put this into perspective for you, Alan. 
You know what's less private than your IP address? My social security number. Okay, this episode is sponsored by Collide. When you go through airport security, there's one line where the TSA agent checks your ID and another where a machine scans your bag. The same thing happens in enterprise security. But instead of passengers and luggage, it's end users and their devices. These days, most companies are pretty good at the first part of the equation, where they check user identity. But user devices can roll right through authentication without getting inspected at all. In fact, a huge percentage of companies allow unmanaged, untrusted devices to access their data. That means an employee can log in from a laptop that has its firewall turned off and hasn't been updated in six months. Or worse, that laptop might belong to a bad actor using employee credentials. Collide finally solves the device trust problem. Collide ensures that no device can log into your Okta-protected apps unless it passes your security checks. Plus, you can use Collide on devices without MDM, like your Linux fleet, contractor devices, and every BYOD phone and laptop in your company. So support the show and go to collide.com slash 25A to watch a demo and see how it works. That's K-O-L-I-D-E dot com slash 25A. Let's do some free consulting then. But first, just a quick thank you to everyone who supports us with PayPal and Patreon. We really do appreciate that. If you want to join those people, you can go to 2.5admins.com slash support. And remember that for various amounts on Patreon, you can get an advert-free RSS feed of either just this show or all the shows in the Late Night Linux family. And you even get some episodes early. And if you want to send in your questions for Jim and Alan or your feedback, you can email show at 2.5admins.com. Adam says, I have the cheapest of cheap Linode servers, one gigabyte of RAM, etc., which I use to host my personal Nextcloud instance. One of the apps installed is Pico CMS, which is a lightweight CMS for making a personal site or blog. All has been good for many years, but then I recently started doing a daily blog on some coding I was undertaking. I linked to my blog entries from Mastodon, but this caused an issue. Every time I toot, my Linode gets slash dotted and goes unresponsive for some time. What Apache config should I use to protect against this? So essentially, this is about setting limits properly. By default, you are very likely using an Apache and PHP manager that is configured with the expectation of far more resources than you have available on your one gig Linode. So the first thing is going to be make sure that Apache is not using the pre-fork worker model. That will likely require a clean reinstallation. If you're already using Apache right now, it can be very difficult to get it to change its mind once it's already been set up and configured. When you're doing that, you want to make sure not to install mod PHP because that will forcibly reconfigure your Apache again into that pre-fork model that you don't want. Instead, you want to use PHP FPM, which is going to provide a CGI gateway for PHP processes, and you will tune its limits individually from Apache's. You need to limit both sides of that, but you're going to have much, much harsher limits on PHP FPM than you do for Apache. Once you've successfully gotten PHP out of Apache's clutches and into PHP FPM, it's probably okay to have a, a fairly large number of simultaneous connections to Apache. You know, something along the lines of like 50 to 100. Even on a 1 gig VM is usually fine, although, again, you're going to need some tuning when you're working with this light a level of resources. The more important one is going to be limiting the number of PHP sessions. You want to limit that very radically, and RAM is usually going to be the bottleneck there. You need to make sure that when somebody opens however many PHP sessions you have allowed in your PHP FPM, that the total amount of RAM used is not going to be enough to send your Linode into swap. Once you manage all of that, you'll be amazed at how much traffic you actually can serve well. A lot of people think that if they detune their Apache or their PHP FPM that way, that it's going to make their website slower. And it's actually usually the opposite case, because what happens is rather than a really badly overworked server that's having to do a lot of expensive context switching in CPU and, you know, potentially seeks and storage, trying to service a lot more users at once than it's really capable of doing well, it's going to serve each one of them individually very rapidly and then go on to the next. So instead of having, you know, 100 users all connecting at once and essentially getting tar pitted, just getting a few characters a second, you have five connect and immediately get the web page and then the next five immediately get theirs and so forth with a net effect that you're not only keeping your site up, but you're actually providing a better experience for your visitors. Interesting thing with Pico CMS is while it's effectively a lightweight CMS, almost a static site generator, 
it is statically generating your site every page load. That's not a static site then, is it? <laughs> it's not a static site generator. It's a lightweight CMS that where you write markdown files and it auto builds the site. It's just on demand. It's not a copy on write file system. No. It's a write on render website. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it, it works fairly well. I used it for a long time. Even used it for the BSD Now website for a while. Although once we had a good collection of tutorials and 300 episodes, it started taking longer and longer to render the site. Part of that was we had a bit of extra logic to show the most recent episodes and stuff, but it did eventually kind of have scaling problems. And especially looking at the fact that you got like one gigabyte of RAM, you might consider moving to something like Hugo. I think it's gohugo.com, where it can take basically the same markdown files you've been writing in Pico CMS, but it will generate a static site of actual HTML files that don't need PHP at all and put them on disk. And then your Apache can serve those with even less memory. And you only have to run it every time you edit the website. You just have it kick off Hugo and it will recompile the site in no time at all. Then you don't need the, the PHP part and you can get that many more visitors served in the same amount of resources. So what you're saying is we shouldn't expect Pico CMS to serve at a nano scale. <laughs> <laughs> now, I replied to Adam's email and I must have just skimmed it because I missed this Pico CMS part and I thought it was WordPress because I suggested using Memcache. Is that something that you can do with Pico CMS, I wonder? Not directly with Pico CMS, although you can use Memcached as the back end for things like APC, the alternative PHP cache. Uh, which can do bytecode caching and object caching to speed up PHP in general. And you definitely need every last bit of that if you're wanting to serve any significant scale from one gig Linode. You can definitely do it. I have been doing it for, you know, more than 10 years. Most of my sites are actually on the one gig Linodes because I've just, I've learned how to do a really good job of tuning even WordPress down so that it won't exceed the limits of the hardware. Obviously, that only scales so far. There's still only so much that the hardware itself can accomplish in a given time frame. But um, I mean, for reference, I've run sites that uh, get anywhere from 15 to 50,000 unique visitors a month on one gig Linodes without any problems. In particular, because this use case is Pico CMS, statically generating HTML might be the way to get that much more performance without having to do a lot of configuration and tuning. But Jim's advice is much more applicable to any other case where you're actually, you know, trying to do something dynamic in PHP and you can still make that work with one gigabyte of RAM. And to be clear, even with no PHP whatsoever, if you're working from a one gig Linode and you expect, you know, to handle any kind of scale, you're still probably going to need to tune Apache's own limits because the default limits that it shifts with uh, from Apache itself in my experience, are almost never overridden by the package managers in the repositories, and they're aimed at some pretty heavy iron. Indeed. Or you could just put Cloudflare in front of it, right? <sighs> uh, it depends. Like, you could literally get into the case where the CDN <laughs> you're putting in front of your website will still send enough traffic to knock over your website, <laughs> and then everybody just gets an error. When I used to consult for a big newspaper here, they had that problem. They used Akamai, one of the biggest CDNs, and... Because this was a major newspaper, they got traffic from all over the world. And that meant that every Akamai node was always being like, where's that page? And hounding them. And their back end was all Microsoft ASP.net on IIS. Oh. So luckily, there was a layer of varnish and Nginx on FreeBSD in front of it, saving its ass from itself. And this was shortly after when Michael Jackson died and like the CNN website had so much traffic that it couldn't serve the CSS with the website. So you just got like the HTML with no style on it and so on. <laughs> and so we specifically tuned the newspaper's website so that in addition to a bunch of caching and all the stuff we'd done in front, we saved off an HTML pay version of the page when we delivered it successfully to somebody so that if we couldn't deliver it successfully to the next person, we could give them that stale copy. Just another datum for anybody who's uh, having trouble believing that just Cloudflare accessing your backend can be enough to, to kill your backend. One of the last web optimization projects that I got involved in that used Varnish, since Alan brought Varnish up, was actually optimizing a Magento site. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, Magento is a, a shopping platform. It's, you know, what people used to put up on their websites back before you 
didn't run a website anymore and you just tried to sell everything at Amazon. But anyway, point being, this is a fairly large company with a very heavily trafficked uh, Magento store and they had Cloudflare in front of it and everything. But uh, a typical page render was something like 5,500 to 6,500 milliseconds before I came in and put varnish in front of it. After I got done tuning varnish and putting that varnish front end in between Magento and Cloudflare, those 5,500 millisecond page render times went down to about 50 millisecond. That's very extreme, but that's kind of the point is that it can get that extreme. Yeah, and varnish can do all kinds of cool things, including server-side includes and was designed actually specifically for a Danish newspaper, I think. And so it had support for, oh, this user's logged in. The content of the story is going to be the same as what we deliver to everybody else. But this widget over the side that has the weather is localized to their zip code, that's going to be different. And being able to tell I can cache the guts of this page, but not the weather makes a big difference than just being like, oh, this user's logged in, so I can't cache anything I show them which is the default with like a WordPress and so on. That was the biggest difference when I put Varnish behind that Magento site is I did exactly what you're talking about. I separated out the cacheable from the non-cacheable elements and made sure they were all handled appropriately. And the net impact was rather than having to render, even though it was just for Cloudflare, every single page as though it were from a logged in user. Now, only the logged in users are actually, you know, triggering the dynamic generated content that has to be unique to them. And as a result... Now, instead of 100% of the site traffic being treated by the back end as though it had to be rendered on the fly on demand, now only the logged in users with something in their shopping cart are actually touching the dynamic part at all, and the rest of it actually can just come from Cloudflare. But that's all probably quite a bit of overkill for a Pico CMS site. <laughs> yes, I, I'm not recommending to anybody that they put a varnish cache in front of their Pico CMS. For one thing, uh, I can't really in good conscience recommend varnish to anybody who needs a recommendation these days because uh, what varnish does not support, and it looks like probably never will, is HTTPS. So if you were going to use Varnish as a front-end cache, you're also going to need an SSL accelerator and figure out how to tie them together and just... At this point, it's easier just to start off with something like Redis and say Varnish was a wonderful tool for its day, but in my opinion, at least, with the refusal to integrate any SSL support, that day is just past. Right, well, we'd better get out of here then. Remember, show at 2.5admins.com if you want to send any questions or your feedback. You can find me at joerest.com slash mastodon. You can find me at mercenarysysadmin.com. And I'm at Alan Jude. We'll see you next week.